Okay, it's uh, two minutes past 11, so I think we should start. So this is the final lecture from Dan on dark matter searches, and I think he'll kick off where he left uh, yesterday. So please get going, Dan. Thanks, Jamie. So um, yeah, so I, I, people may have seen the, um, the slides have been uploaded to the Indico page um, for the last two lectures. Um, so there's a few slides which I didn't get around to uh, covering yesterday on the direct detection. I don't propose to go through them in any detail uh, today. Um, that they're there. If you're interested, please please take a look. Um, they're mostly related to the um, uh, technologies that use uh, charge collection. So, for instance, using CCDs um, and also using uh, gas detectors in News G. Uh, these are sensitive to very low mass uh, WIMPs. Um, so they typically have quite low target masses, but uh, sensitive to very low mass uh, uh, particles because they have very low energy thresholds. Um, another interesting technology is um, what might loosely be called a bubble chamber. This is actually a, a liquid bubble chamber where you're looking for uh, bubbles being created um, in a superheated liquid from basically from the heat that's generated by uh, nuclear recoils. And actually this, this can be designed to be completely insensitive to electron recoils. So you have a, an inbuilt um, uh, electron recoil background rejection. Uh, and so there's an experiment called PICO, um, which is uh, following this approach. Um, basically, it uses the fact that the D by DX that's larger for nuclear recoils um, uh, can create boiling of the liquid, whereas the lower D by DX of electrons doesn't. So um, uh, that's, that's another experiment, particularly sensitive to spin-dependent wimp-proton interactions because it contains fluorine from a C3F8 target. And then we touched briefly yesterday on directional detectors, um, just to say that really those typically use a gas volume, um, so they get a gas detector with maybe a wire chamber readout. Uh, the key challenge is getting the very, very precise um, measurement of very, very short low energy tracks, uh, which is difficult over large drift volumes because of diffusion. So there's various ways to deal with that. One innovative way is to attach elect drifting charge electrons to um, an electronegative gas like CS2 and then drift that through the, um, through the volume and that larger mass of the CS2 minus iron uh, means there's less uh, diffusion. Um, Crucial thing for directionality is, if you can, is to get head-tail discrimination so that you can tell the difference between uh, a nuclear recoil which is going in one direction and one which is going in the other direction. And that can really help you with your directional signal. Um, so that's, that's another technology. And then just to say that um, in terms of the Higgsino benchmarks and the Higgsino and Wino benchmarks that we've been discussing, um, uh, for Wino dark matter, for Susie dark matter, um, the cross section there is, is simply around 10 to minus 47 um, uh, um, square centimeters. And so that's actually approaching where we, we can be sensitive with the next generation experiments. For Higgsinos, the um, pure Higgsinos, the cross sections are typically much lower. And um, you see this plot as a function of Higgs mass. Uh, and so the, the cross sections can be really below 10 to minus 48 square centimeters. So um, unfortunately nature hasn't been kind here. And um, so for pure hexeno dark matter, it, it's even with the next generation of experiments, it's, it could be quite challenging uh, to, to detect pure hexeno uh, dark matter. Uh, there's of course um, caveats to that. If you have other uh, SUSY particles, even relatively close in mass to the, to the lighter SUSY particle, then uh, then you can actually get uh, much larger cross sections. So there's, there's certainly possibilities there. So just to summarize, um, you can see some very nice summaries here from both the APEC community report that I mentioned yesterday on the left, and also from the PDG review from Baudis and uh, Profumo on the right. Um, so you can see basically that the green area, roughly speaking, is where we are already excluded. Um, incidentally, what, one thing to note for the Collider people among you is that Conventionally, these lim exclusion limits are 90% confidence level in, in, um, in dark matter searches rather than 95%. So that's just something to watch out for. Um, but um, the limits are pushing down, really getting close to the uh, sort of a corner of the neutrino floor now. And so in the next generation experiments in the bottom left figure, 
should be pushing right down towards the neutrino floor, um, even in the high mass uh, region. So these experiments have developed massively over the past 30 years or more, um, and are still going strong. Um, you can see how the, the limits are progressing downwards, and so the next generation of experiments will be, will be pushing down uh, the most optimistic masses down towards 10 to the minus 48 uh, square centimetres. Okay, so um, I'll move on to the main topic for today, which is um, the uh, WIMPs at, at colliders and also searches for light dark matter. So we're moving down in, in mass. Um, we've still got to discuss WIMPs at, at colliders, but then we'll really start moving down much, much further in mass. Um, and just to recap, of course, um, the three technologies that we're studying, indirect searches, direct searches, and now we're going to be discussing accelerator searches for WIMPs. Uh, and the advantage here is that if you do see a signal, particularly if it's accompanied by additional particles in your, in your uh, collider, then in, in your experiment, then you have some chance of getting some more indication of what, what the, the, the dark matter particle is and what, what the underlying theory is. But of course, the, 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 the disadvantage is that um, you need enough center of mass energy to produce them. So um, uh, unlike, for instance, in an indirect or direct detection experiment where you have um, basically the, the Big Bang is your, is your collider. Uh, well, certainly in, 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 direct, in direct detection experiments it is. Um, yeah, so we're, we're going to be looking at WIMPs at colliders. And before we get on to some results, I thought it would be interesting to just discuss the, the technique that we use to identify um, dark matter signals at, at colliders, be that the LHC or lepton colliders like LEP, and then in the future, possibly ILC, CEPC, or FCC, for instance, or muon collider. Now, um, the basic signature is, is the same as actually in a, in a direct detection experiment. It's an, uh, an, an imbalance of momentum uh, in, your, uh, in your process. So in a direct detection experiment, you see a, uh, a, um, an atomic nucleus recoiling against nothing, basically. It's, it's been hit by something invisible and it's recoiled off. And, and um, that's an, in terms of visible particles, that's an imbalance in, in momentum. It's apparent non-conservation of momentum. And the same is true in a, in a collider. Um, so we look for an imbalance in uh, momentum coming from the emission of invisible dark matter particles. Uh, and if you are working at a lepton collider where you have a well-defined initial state because you have um, a collision of two, uh, two initial state particles, E plus E minus, for instance, with well-defined momentum, so you know that your initial state basically is at rest in the lab frame, then you can use the full three-dimensional momentum vector uh, of the um, visible final state particles, add them up, and if that is zero, then there's no missing momentum, whereas if it's uh, non-zero, then the, the opposite of that to balance the momentum is what we call the missing energy, and that is what is carried away by the whatever dark matter particles you've, you've created. Uh, at hadron colliders like the LHC, or before that the Tevatron, or in the future FCCHH, uh, the initial state is not so well defined, so you don't have a, a constraint along the beam direction and the Z directions conventionally defined. So you have to really balance the momentum only in the, in the, two, in the transverse plane, transverse to the beam line. Um, and this then forms the equivalent quantity, which is the two-dimensional vector, the missing transverse energy, ET miss. Uh, and when measuring these things, particularly the Hadron Collider, you have to be careful with um, soft particles that might be created in the collisions because this sort of unclustered energy that isn't associated with any particular high energy particle like an um, electron or a muon or a jet or something, um, this can um, cause some difficulties if you're trying to measure low values of missing transverse momentum. So you have to be careful when, um, when measuring the full energies, um, uh, visible energy in these, in these experiments. Uh, I should also mention that in a lepton collider, there's a further benefit that comes from the fact that you do have such a well-defined um, um, initial state. So not only is the um, 
uh, collision frame of reference, the central mass frame, at rest in the lab, but also you know the uh, collision energy um, very accurately in a lepton collider. And you can use this constraint to um, build something which, depending on how it's defined, is called the missing mass or the recoil mass, uh, which is defined there. So this is simple uh, relativistic kinematics. And from this, you can basically work out the, the, the um, total invariant mass of the system, which is recoiling against your, um, uh, your visible system. So you can see an example in the bottom right. You see an example from LEP, where they're looking at um, system recoiling um, uh, against a photon. Um, and you see a nice big peak there against the Z, which is basically from coming from Z to new new bar decays, so invisible Z decays. And on the right, you see from a study at CEP, in the, I think the CEPC uh, CDR, uh, an equivalent example where you're looking at recoil against the, against the Higgs, um, uh, or rather you're looking at Higgs, Higgs events recoiling against the Z rather. And so you see a nice big uh, Higgs, Higgs mass peak there. So that's another tool that you have to identify um, invisible decays at a lepton collider. So the LHC, um, really there's two classes of um, uh, dark matter searches. First of all, there's model dependent searches where you, you know what the underlying, or you have an assumption about the underlying uh, dynamics, the underlying model, uh, for instance, supersymmetry. And so you are looking for the production of dark matter particles, often in association with other things, other particles. And these additional states and initial particles in the final state can give you some extra handles on identifying signals and rejecting backgrounds. Um, and also, if the dark matter particles are created in the decay of, of heavier, strongly interacting BSM states, then that can give you some additional uh, mass reach because um, those particles might be strongly interacting and therefore have a larger cross section. Clearly, this is less inclusive uh, than you might like because you have to make some assumptions about the underlying model. Um, for SUSY, um, this is primarily used for um, R parity conserving models, where, as I said, the, uh, uh, it said in lecture one, the, um, the LSP is, is um, stable and neutral. Uh, and also, that also requires that the uh, SUSY particles are produced in pairs. So you're looking at pair production of, of uh, dark matter particles. And then there are generic dark matter searches, which are really just looking for invisible states recoiling uh, against uh, some arbitrary standard model state, be it a photon or a Z or a Higgs or something. Uh, so this is where the dark matter is coupling to possibly indirectly um, and recoiling against a, a specified final state. Um, in those cases, we typically use a simplified model uh, of dark matter production, which involves a dark matter particle and some kind of mediator particle, which you see in the, the Feynman diagram on the, the bottom right. Um, and then the model is then parameterized in terms of the masses of the states involved, their couplings, and then of course their uh, 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 spin parity uh, properties of both the dark matter state and, and the mediator. Um, so um, um, it's worth noting, note, noting here that if you can produce dark matter particles via this mediator state in the collision of two protons, um, then that implies that the mediator state can then also decay to two hadronic particles, because if it can couple to hadrons, then it can, in the production, it can couple to hadrons in the decay. So very strong constraints on these kind of models, also provided by um, resonance searches, hadronic resonance searches. Uh, and here again, you're usually assuming dark matter pair production. There's a lot more information on this, on the uh, LPCC CERN um, LHC Dark Matter Working Group website. So there's a link there, so you can see, see some more details there. So in terms of the, the kinematics that we can use to search, first of all, for, for SUSY states, um, these typically, as I said, have longer decay chains. So we're producing the dark matter in the decay of heavier states. And because those decays produce additional final state particles, you can use those properties and the kinematics of those particles to provide additional constraints on the system. And um, what this gives rise to are typically endpoints in some kinematic variables. Um, 
So in other words, uh, the, uh, some suitably defined variables can only take a, uh, uh, up to a maximum uh, value for um, signals and for some background. And the classic example of this is the transverse mass, MT2, uh, proposed in 1999. Um, and there's also another example called the contransverse mass. Uh, there are also inclusive variables which are used where you basically, they're, they're less well-defined theoretically, and you, but, but they sort of, they're correlated with the, the kinematics of the process. And the classic example here is what's called the effective mass, which is basically just the scalar sum of the transverse momenta of all the final state particles plus the missing transverse energy. So these are variables which can be used to um, discriminate signal from background in the right hand figure. You can see an example of where for the, for the transverse mass, you can see that the main background, the, um, uh, the WW decays in blue, um, they have an endpoint near MW. Um, and so that allows you to reject a lot of that background. So that's, that's an example of the, the benefit of these kind of variables. So in terms of direct searches for production of, um, uh, of dark matter particles, if you just produce two dark matter particles, two LSPs, which I've written as chi-01, chi-01 here, um, there's no, really, you can't see that at the LHC because it's, it's basically nothing's happened as far as your trigger and, and your selection, event selection is concerned in your experiment. So you can't see that at all unless there's some other uh, final state particle produced. I should say conventionally, SUSY particles are denoted with a tilde over the Greek letter. Um, I'm afraid I've been a bit lazy and so in the text I've <laughs> omitted putting tildes on every, every, uh, every symbol. Um, so what we, perhaps the closest to see, looking for direct LSP pair production that we can do is to look for pair production or look for associated production of slightly heavier electroweak uh, SUSY particles. So for instance, a next to lightest neutralino, chi-02, and a chargino, chi-plus uh, or chi-minus-1. Uh, these can decay in many different ways depending on the, um, uh, the model. Um, for instance, they can decay to W, the, the um, Chargino can decay to a W plus an LSP and the Chi-2 can decay to a Z plus an LSP, uh, or you can get a W and a Higgs, or you can get decays via Sleptons, the SUSY partner of the leptons. Um, these give rise to different final states with different numbers of leptons typically. Um, leptons are useful in these searches incidentally because we can trigger and identify them with re very relatively low uh, transverse momentum thresholds. So that gives us sensitive to light, uh, uh, light states and also to um, states where there's the, uh, the chi-2 and the, uh, the chi-1, for instance, are very close in mass and, and don't produce a lot of energy in the decay. So if you produce leptons, then you can identify these events more effectively. Um, in many models, the, the chi, well, certainly in, in many MSSM models, the chi 2 and chi 1, uh, chi plus or minus 1, are mass degenerate. So they're mostly hexena. Um, and so you can make that assumption. So you see in the bottom left hand and right hand plots, uh, you can see that they've assumed that the, um, that the masses are identical. And then you basically plot your limits uh, as a function of both the mass of the initial produced particle and the mass of the, of the, of the dark matter particle that it's decaying into the LSP. And so you can see some examples here from Atlas and CMS. Um, and um, the, you see that the LSP masses for the given range of, um, uh, of, of Chargino and, and NLSP masses, the LSP mass rate is being excluded up to, uh, you know, a, a, 400, 500 uh, or more um, GeV. Um, but this is obviously dependent on the model. Um, and these are simplified models that we typically use here, where we basically just have a SUSY particle content, which is um, uh, the, the particles you see here. So if you're, to come back to the benchmark that we've been discussing um, for the last few days, the we knowing Higgs Zeno searches, uh, one of the features of this is that if you have, uh, for instance, a Higgsino or Wino LSP, then it is very 
close in mass to the next the lightest Susie particle, which is basically a, has a similar uh, um, content in terms of uh, Bino, Wino, and Higgsinos. So the mass splitting is typically very small, and this gives rise to uh, a, a non-zero lifetime for the um, for the initially produced states of so the NLSP. Um, and so you could, if you're lucky, see these things decay inside your detector. And this gives one, one signature where you basically look for a disappearing track um, where basically um, you see the decay products pointing back towards the, um, the interaction point. Um, but they appear to come from basically from, from nowhere, basically because there's been an, uh, a particle has, um, has uh, decayed and um, uh, so you, you, see, you see the decay products, you see perhaps an initial uh, particle coming out and then basically there's, there's a, an imbalance of momentum somewhere inside the detector basically. So these are called disappearing track signatures uh, and you can see some examples of some searches here uh, with the full run two, LHC run two data set. Um, and I draw your attention to particularly the um, uh, bottom left hand uh, figure where you can see um, the uh, limits coming from a search that also that uses um, soft leptons, as I mentioned on the last slide, which is the blue excluded region. And then also from this disappearing track signature, which is the orange excluded region. And there's also a curve there for the theoret theoretical prediction for a pure Higgsino. Um, and you can see that the mass limits for the uh, Chargino and the almost mass degenerate LSP are up to around 200 GeV. Now this is of course way below the 1.1 TeV that we that we would see expect for a uh, a completely pure Higgsino dark matter candidate. But um, this is nevertheless a way of, of probing those those models. So what else can you do? Well, you can look for production of LSP dark matter in the decay of heavier states. And if those are strongly interacting states, then that gives you a larger cross section and in principle gives you greater mass reach for the, the, uh, the LSP. So for instance, you can look for um, uh, production of the SUSY partners of the top quarks or the stops or top squarks, pair produced as in the right, top right hand diagram. Um, and um, there again, depending on the stop mass, you can probe uh, LSP masses up to a bit higher than previously, so maybe 500, 600, uh, or maybe a bit more uh, GeV. Um, and um, so that gives you a bit more of a, uh, of a handle. Um, and then to go even further, um, you can then look for the production of gluinos, Susie so partners of the gluon. Um, and if these are produced in the initial, uh, initially pair produced, these have a, a high cross section. Uh, they can ha often have long decay chains, which gives rise, depending on the, the other details of the SUSY model, can give rise to lots of other jets of particles in the, in the final state. B jets, which uh, give you some more handles on identifying these events. So that can be very useful for re rejecting background. And also in many SUSY models, um, the gluino mass is correlated with the stop mass so they're not completely independent uh, certainly if you if you build self-consistent SUSY models um, they are related through basically through um, uh, uh, loop corrections this is sometimes called the gluino sucks uh, feature the, the mass of the gluino sucks the mass of the top squawk uh, uh, up up to, to towards it um, so you might expect, for instance, um, top squawks to be produced perhaps off shell virtually in the decay of the gluinos, which gives rise to the B-jet signature. Um, and these searches then can give you still greater uh, sensitivity to uh, the LSP mass. So here you're looking at gluino masses up to above a TV. And for those mass regions, then you're looking at uh, sensitivity to LSP dark matter masses uh, which actually exceed 1.1 uh, TV. So again, these are uh, giving you possibilities for um, probing these models, but of course, very model dependent in this case, because you need a gluino to be present. And I'll just touch on uh, possibilities at FCCHH, where there's been a study conducted of this uh, disappearing track signature, 
And you can see here that um, for the kind of masses that we expect for um, a dark matter, kind of, don't forget this is chargino mass degenerate with, a, with the LSP, um, you are getting significances uh, for certainly for we know uh, LSPs well above five sigma. And even for Higgsino uh, LSP, you're above five sigma. So this, this gives a strong possibility for discovering pure we know or Higgsino uh, dark matter. The generic searches, as I said, are looking for dark matter recoiling against a, um, a visible state. So for instance, a gluon, which gives rise to a, a jet. Uh, and you can see an example in the bottom left figure here of the uh, momentum of um, monojets produced in this case in Atlas. And, um, and then basically you would see, this is basically a jet recoiling against, against nothing. Of course, there's a major background coming from jets recoiling against the Z decaying to new new, which is invisible. Um, but this provides you with one way of, of searching for uh, these events. And of course, you can look at other final states, other, other particles you're recoiling against. So the bottom right hand figure shows, um, in, if you look at the, the sort of the, the hump, hump to regions at the bottom of the figure, these are the limits coming from various uh, mono object uh, uh, searches. So monojets, monophotons, etc., recoiling against dark matter. Um, but the, the other colored uh, limits are coming from the resonance searches that, um, that I mentioned. So here you're looking for the mediator, um, if, if, because you have to make an assumption about that mediator, the mediator is then decaying back to a hadronic final state. So this provides limits. Um, they're complementary to the mono object searches, particularly because if you, the couplings are such that the, if a mediator is produced, then it preferentially decays to the dark matter state rather than to the, um, the, the hadronic final state, then of course you won't see the resonance signal. So, so they're complementary to each other. Um, but these are, um, you know, again, producing very uh, interesting limits on, um, on generic dark matter models. Um, these results incidentally can also be presented in the context of for specific model assumptions in the context of the di direct dark matter search parameter space that we were looking at yesterday. Uh, and you can see these presented here. Um, you, again, you have to make your assumptions about what sort of mediator you're dealing with, what the couplings are, and similarly for the, uh, the dark matter, what sort of dark matter you're working with. Um, those limits are very model dependent, but I think it's fair to say that where they really come into their own is actually at the very low mass range where the direct searches are less powerful because of kinematics, um, but the, the collider searches are, are um, under those model assumptions um, and also actually under astrophysical model assumptions in terms of the comparison uh, are, are doing very well. Uh, and then finally, I'll just comment on the, uh, another route that we can use, which is to look for invisible decays of the Higgs. We have now produced many Higgs bosons at the LHC. And we can um, search, uh, in particular in the vector boson fusion production mode, we can search for decays of the Higgs boson into basically invisible final states. So here you're basically looking for, in the VBF production mode, you're looking for two forward jets and, um, and then an invisible state uh, in, the, in the center of the detector. Clearly this is only relevant if the dark matter particle has a mass which is less than half of the Higgs mass for it to be kinematically possible. Um, but these, this provides limits. You can also strengthen these by making some assumptions about the total branching ratio of the Higgs and then using also the various Higgs coupling uh, measurements in other final states. Um, and these provide very powerful uh, limits in what are called Higgs portal models, where basically the dark matter is coupling uh, via a Higgs boson to, to st the standard model. And um, that can then be translated directly into the um, direct detection parameter space that you see on the right. And again, these provide very stringent limits up to half the Higgs mass. So which is where you see these, the blue and red curves heading up to infinity, um, but are particularly sensitive again to the lower mass uh, dark matter states. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to heavy neutrino dark matter, very briefly. So this is now we're working down, this is in the KV to MEV range. 
Um, so heavy light-handed, uh, sorry, heavy left-handed uh, neutrinos with standard model couplings uh, have been excluded for quite some time from direct, by direct searches, um, basically via their T-channel couplings to, to Z, uh, Z mediators. Uh, on the other hand, a right-handed singlet um, um, neutrino, new R, possibly mixing with left-handed standard model neutrinos, um, is, is certainly allowed. Um, so you could have um, some small mixing angle between those states. Uh, the new R could then decay to, to three uh, left-handed states, which is invisible. Um, so that, that doesn't really help you. But if, if it decays to a left-handed state and a, and a photon, then you get a monoenergetic photon signal, which you can use to, to search for these indirectly. Um, there's a concrete model that you can see here from um, uh, Asaka, Blanchet and uh, Shaposhnikov called the new MSM. Um, and here, this is a concrete model uh, which has basically the N1, which is the lightest new R um, as a dark matter candidate. And this model is proposed also to solve quite a few other problems like baryogenesis and the neutrino masses. So there was some excitement a few years ago uh, in, in this area because there was some evidence seen for um, a three and a half kV X-ray line uh, in data from uh, various uh, satellite uh, X-ray observatories. Um, uh, it's, you can sort of see um, in the bottom left-hand figure sort of the excess here. Um, it's subsequent studies have not observed this in, 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 um, in other targets and with other, uh, by other groups. Uh, and in particular in dwarf galaxies, as I mentioned in the first lecture, which provide a very good target for studying uh, dark, indirect dark matter signals because they're dominate, often dominated by, by dark matter and have very little uh, non-dark matter content. Um, these, these didn't confirm this. Um, there's been some discussion that this may be, this uh, excess may be due to some unidentified X-ray line. Um, so there's various possibilities there. Um, I think really the, the real proof of this would come, or the real test comes from a future mission um, called, uh, I'm not actually sure how you pronounce this, X-RISM, um, which is basically a follow-on from the Japanese satellite Hitomi, which unfortunately uh, uh, failed soon after launch a few years ago. Uh, that will have um, a very high resolution calorimeter uh, on board for very, very high, so it's a, a thermal calorimeter, which has a very high um, precision, um, uh, a very small resolution, which um, would test this three and a half kV line uh, very stringently. Um, I'm not going to talk about other searches for these kind of signals. Of course, particularly at CERN, this is a, a major target with the ship proposal, for instance, looking for the production of the uh, heavier uh, uh, states, so produced in D decays, and then um, so the N2 and N3, and then decaying subsequently. Uh, and there's also possibilities of searches at FCC EE, uh, following similar searches at LEP. So there's lots of possibilities for testing these models, but um, since then, we're not talking directly about the dark matter state, so I'll, I'll skip over them rather briefly. So now moving down to lower masses, much lower masses, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, axion and ALP dark matter, or axion-like particles, ALPs. Um, and um, as I guess many of you will know, the, uh, the QCD axion is uh, a consequence of Petiquin mechanism which is designed to dy dynamically explain um, the lack of CP violation or could be CP conservation in strong interaction. So we, we conserve CP in the strong interaction, but not in the weak interaction. Why is that? Uh, and this potentially arises from um, something called the Petty Quinn symmetry, which is a spontaneously broken global U1 symmetry, which has a, a particle associated with it, which is the axion. It's the pseudo Nambu Goldstone boson for this symmetry. So it's a bit like the Higgs mechanism. And one way to explain this, uh, which is quite nice, which comes from Pierre Sikivi, uh, is um, imagine that you have a, a pool table on a, um, on a slope and you want to play pool on that. 
how can you ensure that your uh, pool table is, is level, even though it's mounted on a slope? And one way to do this would be to mount it on, on effectively on a pendulum. And um, so with a, a, a mass at the bottom, which balances your table. So that's sort of like restoring, the, that's a dynamic restoration of a sort of symmetry for your pool table and the fact that it's level. Um, but there is a consequence of that mechanism, which is that if you excite that pendulum, uh, you can get oscillations. And that excitation is a bit like the, um, the oscillation, which it gives, is equivalent to the, uh, the axion uh, particle in, in, in the uh, Pechiquin mechanism. So, so it's a sort of, it's a, it's a, rough, a rough explanation as to how the symmetry uh, and the restoration, the dynamical rep restoration of this symmetry is re then related to um, um, a harmonic oscillation of the, of the restoration process. So more generically, we can have um, axion-like particles, which are basically pseudoscalar bosons coupling in a similar way to the standard model fields. And the axion and ALPS couple at one loop to the, the photon. So they, they have a, a, a hadronic um, state, which gives an effective coupling to the, um, to the photon, which modifies the electromagnetic interactions. And this gives us a route to search for it via something called the inverse Primakov effect, which basically involves an axion uh, dark matter particle coming into our detector. And then we put a, a powerful magnetic field, which has virtual photons uh, within it. And the axon interacts with those virtual photons and creates a real photon. Uh, and we detect that real photon. Um, and uh, so this is really the, the origin of many of these axion search experiments. The parameter space that we use, uh, we plot it as a function of both the axion mass on the x-axis and the coupling between the axion and the, and the photons, the effective coupling G axion gamma gamma on the y-axis. And this enables us to really compare a whole very large range of different experiments. And, and this is actually one of the features of axion and out searches is that you have through this signature, this one signature, uh, you have a very large number of, of possibilities for innovative technology detectors for searching for this signature. Um, and we can compare them on this kind of plot. Uh, two benchmark models, there's the KSVZ model, which has the standard model quarks uncharged under the petri quin symmetry. So this means that there's no tree level axion quark couplings. And the DFSZ model, which does have them charged under petri quin uh, and has some additional particle content as well. The relic density can be calculated for these models. Um, it, make, it requires some assumptions about how the, um, how the axons are being created and when, it take, when the petri quin symmetry breaking takes place, um, which is when the axions acquire mass. Um, so it's not as simple actually as, as a WIMP signature. Um, so we can have axions uh, forming from topological defects, for instance, um, in the uh, post-inflation scenario. Um, and in the pre-inflation scenario, uh, you get axions, form axions forming from vacuum realignment. And depending on the assumptions, uh, then basically the models that give you the um, uh, relic density that we, we want for, um, uh, for agreement with the CMB observations, for the post-inflation scenario, then you're looking down around 10 to minus 4 EV, um, whereas for the pre-inflation scenarios, it depends on basically on a parameter called the vacuum misalignment angle, um, but it can be to much lower masses. So axion searches are a huge area, and I don't have time in my remaining um, 20 minutes to go through, <laughs> through all of them. So um, just to say that because of this signature, um, of axions interacting with photons, and, and in particular the axions being, or outs being very light, uh, you can search for axions, not just through dark matter signatures, but also from production of axions, for instance, in stars or the sun, or by producing them in the lab. And so you get strong constraints from stellar cooling, from astrophysics, basically production of axions can cool the stars. Um, 
you can look for directly for axions produced in the sun and those are what are called helioscopes and examples there are cast at CERN and, and also IAXO in the future. Um, and then you, we've already seen an example yesterday where also solar axions can couple with electrons and therefore you can look for electron recalls at low energy in, um, uh, in direct WIMP searches, basically because the energies of the axions are correlated with the energies of the of, of effectively of the, of the plasma in the in the sun so you get higher energy axions um, if you produce axions in the lab then you have experiments like sort of shining light through walls experiments um, where you you basically have a laser which converts in a strong magnetic field to an axion the axon can penetrate through an optical barrier and then in another magnetic field you convert the axions back to photons so that's that's another possibility and then basically Axion models can modify uh, the laws of electromagnetism, uh, basically. So you also have searches for things like vacuum, anomalous sources of vacuum birefringence, um, which can also give you strong constraints. So that's just to touch on those. But I, I really want to focus on axion dark matter searches. And the main technology here is what's called the cavity haloscope uh, from Sikivi in 1983, where you basically have a strong magnetic field, solenoidal magnetic field, uh, in a, a dilution fridge, so this is a cryogenic experiment, and then you have a very, very sensitive radio receiver and amplifier, which looks for uh, a radio signal coming from conversion of axions to real microwave photons inside the cavity. And you tune the cavity so that it's in resonance with the, um, uh, with the signal that you're looking for. So it uses this inverse Primakoff effect. Uh, one interesting point about this compared with um, direct WIMP searches is that it's a narrow band search. So the time taken for your search, these are, you know, these are long, many year, multi-year experiments. The time required is the time to scan your, uh, the, the resonance of your cavity across the mass range or equivalently across the microwave frequency range. This means that if you do see a possible signal, you can then go back and then check it with a much longer run time uh, around that uh, a scan effectively around that frequency. So it's a bit like, um, for instance, a collider at LEP, for instance, you see the Z and then you can go back and you can do a, a, a scan around the Z to understand its properties. So it's easy to rescan to confirm a, a resonance signal. The longest running experiments uh, is called ADMX um, in, in uh, the US. Uh, following on some, from some previous experiments. Uh, here they have an eight Tesla solenoid. Uh, they have a mechanically tuned cavity. So they have a tuning rod, which they move uh, inside the cavity to change the resonant frequency. Um, they have cryogenic uh, quantum noise limited amplifiers. So they have a squid amplifier uh, uh, and um, Josephson parametric amplifiers. And this is actually the world's lowest noise production microwave receiver. So a receiver that's actually doing something rather than in development. Um, and this is really the first experiment which has been sensitive over a, over a certain mass range to uh, both KSVZ and DFSC uh, axion, QCD axion models. Um, so you see that si the size of this uh, um, cavity uh, is measured in the sort of meter scales. And this is really then directly related to the frequency range and mass range that can be scanned. So if you want to go to different frequencies or different masses, then you need different size cavities. So Haystack, which is a sort of a branch out from ADMX, what's called ADMX uh, high frequency. This uses a smaller cavity, uses a similar technology, uh, nine Tesla field, smaller volume. Of course, if you go to smaller volumes, then you can uh, have get a, a larger magnetic field because you the magnet is has less stored energy um, but you have smaller volume so you you have to run for longer to to get same sensitivity um, so this initial run targeted um, uh, some sort of uh, post-inflationary petty quin symmetry breaking models with masses of around 23 to 24 micro ev and then the latest results just released uh, use um, some novel uh, quantum technology to squeeze the, the microwave state and exceed the quantum noise limit um, to get better sensitivity. And this targets around 17 micro EV. 
is that the, these experiments are, particularly at the high frequency end, are quite small. So um, uh, you necessarily, unless you're going to multiply the number of solenoids that you, you build, um, you can't have a very large uh, uh, cavity. Uh, and so you typically have high fields, small cavities. Uh, and these are not quite bench top experiments, but they're, they're much smaller than, a, <laughs> than the LHC or a collider experiment. So there's quite a few of these around the world. Uh, there's a list of them here. Uh, and you can see a summary from a uh, recent preprint, um, bottom right, where you can see uh, each one of those lines is a different experiment. And they're all pushing down in different mass regions down towards those benchmark models, the uh, KSBC and DFSC models. Now, I thought I'd just mention indirect axion dark matter surges. I think this is a, a really nice idea. Uh, you know, the kind of magnetic fields that we're producing in terrestrial solenoids, if we're lucky, are up around 10 Tesla or maybe a bit more. Um, those are nowhere near the maximum, the largest magnetic fields in the universe. Uh, in neutron stars, and in particular, one class of neutron star, magnetar, uh, you can get B fields that are up in the 10, getting towards 10 to the 11 Tesla. So, so this gives very good possibilities for um, uh, axion photon conversion, just like in the haloscope. But of course, this is happening way out in the universe. There's many other processes that can fake uh, a microwave signal coming from, uh, um, from out in a, in a radio telescope. So um, but recently there's been a, a, um, one, one experiment uh, carried out using the Green Bank and Effelsberg telescopes, um, using again inverse Primakov effect and looking for a resonant signal uh, that comes from axion to photon conversion in, in neutron stars. Um, it's not yet competitive with the haloscopes, but it's, it's promising. I think it's a really interesting technology that is developing. Um, now, um, if you're looking for higher frequency, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, higher mass uh, axions, the, as I said, the problem is the, the volume of the, um, of your uh, resonant cavity uh, goes like one over the cube of the axion mass. So you'd like to beat this. And one way to do this is to use what's called a dielectric haloscope. So the Mad Max proposal is, is the, the, the first one here. And the idea here is that you, you move from the three-dimensional resonance to a two-dimensional resonance, basically. So you are looking at, um, um, you put uh, disks, uh, dielectric disks, uh, inside a strong magnetic field. And you get axion to photon conversion, basically the permittivity boundary uh, of disks and the vacuum uh, and, and the surroundings. Um, and you tune these disks um, so that uh, their separation is uh, basically lambda over two for the for the wavelength of the axions. And you basically perform a long create uh, with a mirror at one end a longitudinal cavity. Um, so the transverse dimensions are non-resonant. But the signal scales with the basically the length of your uh, of your of your cavity. So you're moving effectively from three dimensions. Sorry, to, to, I said two dimensions. I meant one dimension. Uh, you're looking at a, a resonance in in the longitudinal direction. Uh, so this is the Mad Max experiment, which is um, uh, really just uh, developing and and is providing um, uh, very interesting sensitivity in, in the higher higher mass end. Uh, so this is where the, the, the wavelength is shorter. Um, and uh, right, so then um, moving to lower masses, if you get to very low mass axions, um, then the, um, the, the, the signals start to be, or the, 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 the Compton wavelength of these particles starts to become um, uh, macroscopic and this can give rise to additional signals um, so you can start to see actually time dependent uh, fields being created um, so at very low masses the abracadabra collaboration for instance is using um, a, a b field inside a toroidal cavity with a toroidal static b field 
and it's using a tuned LC circuit to look for basically an uh, uh, alternating B field being induced inside that cavity, uh, which is, and so the, that time dependence is coming from the fact that really you're, you're seeing a, 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 a very low axial masses, you're really seeing a state which is no longer just a particle, it's actually a wave. And so you're using the quantum nature of the, of the axion to give you a, a time dependent signal. And similar approach is taken by the DM radio collaboration. Um, again, at low masses, um, again, looking for these uh, time dependent signals, you can use magnetic resonance. Um, and in these experiments here, you are looking for interaction with uh, hyperpolarized nuclei, xenon 129 and helium 3. So, Casper wind uh, is looking for spin precession in these nuclei with basically nuclear magnetic resonance techniques. Uh, coming from this oscillating field. Um, and then uh, there's also some possibilities of using um, uh, the axion gluon coupling, um, which gives you an oscillating nuclear electron dipole moment, and that's in Casper uh, electric. Um, and then finally, we have another proposal uh, where the um, coupling with the electron spin induces magnetic resonance in a ferromagnetic material in the external B field. And then you look for Larmor uh, uh, precession. And this is the quacks uh, experiment. So there's, I think this is really just to convince you that there's a huge range of different technologies that we can use in Axion and Alp searches. And really there's the opportunity for innovation, very innovative experimental techniques, which can give you meaningful and um, uh, leading sensitivity over particular mass ranges. So there's, it's a really a burgeoning field, I would say, um, axion and health dark matter searches. So here's the summary um, of showing a broad range of um, searches across this mass range, um, as we've just uh, discussed. And uh, clearly these, these, given the amount of interest in this area, these limits will be coming down uh, very, very quickly. And of course, hopefully we will start to see some kind of signal, for instance, a resonance in a, in a halo scope. Uh, and then very quickly, we might then get some confirmation from other experiments because you can just, often you can just dwell on that. that once you know where to look, you can confirm a signal very quickly. And I'll finish up by talking about very, very light dark matter, uh, where generically the wavelength of the dark matter is becoming macroscopic. And here, the impact, the, the effect is equivalent to that of a time varying sort of fifth force. So then you can start to use uh, experiments such as atom interferometers uh, and look for time varying signals. Examples are MAGIS and AION um, to give you sensitivity to these really, really low mass uh, dark matter uh, states. Uh, and again, there's huge potential for innovation here. Um, particularly because, as many people will know, quantum technologies are a, a, a really growing and um, well-funded uh, area of research these days with uh, relationships also to quantum information and quantum metrology. So um, this, this is an area where um, I think, again, although this is really just starting out at the moment, this will have some really big breakthroughs in, in the near future. So just to finish up, um, Grand summary, uh, in general, dark matter searches have grown very rapidly over the past 40 years or so. Um, they started out really as a, a very niche area of, of astroparticle physics, very small scale experiments, tabletop experiments, um, but they've grown very rapidly. And now they're really a major component, not just of astroparticle physics, but also of astrophysics via indirect searches and also collider physics and accelerator physics. At the same time, the range of candidates and interactions has expanded massively. Um, so we're not just looking for WIMPs now, uh, which were the initial candidates. Um, clearly, the, uh, the non-observation of SUSY particles so far at the LHC has also prompted a lot of this interest in other candidates. Um, I'd say that no other area of particle physics really has similar opportunities for, for innovation in detector design. Uh, and with potentially a low barrier to realization, you know, some of these new experiments are really quite small scale and, and don't cost a lot of money. And so if someone, 
maybe someone on, on the call has a bright idea for how to search for axions coupling coupling to photons then potentially uh, there's a pretty low barrier to to realizing that of course if a signal is seen then the payoff is potentially immense in terms of our understanding of the universe and i guess i would say, just round off by saying the field really has never been in better health okay i'll stop there Great. Thanks a lot, Dan, for this really nice lecture. Do we have um, any questions? Please raise your hand if you have a question or comment. Maybe uh, I'll, I'll start with one just on this very ultra light dark matter that you showed on maybe the previous slide. So is this not, um, this is obviously super relativistic. So is that then not disfavored by the, what you said in the first lecture from cosmology? Um, mm, uh, it's certainly, I guess it's certainly relativistic, but um, I guess the, for sufficiently low mass, then you're still sensitive to the time variation. So um, I, I, I I guess you're talking about whether it's hot dark matter or not. Oh, yeah, um, that's what, yeah, so yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a cosmologist, so I, I think I will take the fifth on that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> Um, does anyone else have any questions, comments for Dan? Okay, I, I don't see anything. So um, I think we can probably leave it there. So thanks very much again, Dan, for these three really interesting lectures. Just to say uh, the slides will be uploaded. They're already uploaded for the previous two and this one will be uploaded today. And there's also uh, gonna be a, a video uh, link which will be uploaded to the Indica agenda uh, soon. So thanks again, Dan. and. Um, yeah. Pleasure. See you sometime soon, I hope. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Bye-bye. Yes.